Ethan and Joel Cohen are renowned as brilliant filmmakers, but they also happen to be master screenwriters. So today we're going to uncover some of the screenwriting secrets in their 1996 masterpiece, Fargo, number 32 on the WGA's list of the 101 greatest screenplays. Here are four screenwriting secrets in the movie Fargo. When there's a bit of a complex plot, good screenwriters usually establish the rules of the game early on in the story. This allows the audience to follow the rest of the story without confusion. In the Fargo screenplay, the Coen brothers set this up masterfully. We first have the scene where Jerry Lundergaard meets with Carl Showalter and Gear Grimsrud. The new vehicle plus $40,000. You want your own wife kidnapped? Yeah. You pay the ransom, what, 80,000 bucks? I mean, you give us half the ransom, 40000 you keep half. It's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, see, I just need the money. The thing is, my wife, she's wealthy. Her dad, he's real well off. So why don't you just ask him for the money? Well, your fucking wife, you know. They don't know I need it. And even if they did, I wouldn't get it. Then we have the early conversation between Jerry and his father-in-law, Wade. Wade, have you had a chance to think about that deal I was talking about, those 40 acres there in Wyzetta? Uh, I mean, a parking lot. Ah, well, 750000 is a lot. And finally, Jerry receives this phone call. It's okay. The loans are in place. I already got the... Yeah, the uh, 320000 You got the money last month. Yeah. We have an audit here. I just have to know that these vehicles you're financing with this money, that they really exist. So now that the rules of the game have been established, what's the next thing that happens? Gene Lundergaard is kidnapped, and the story takes off. In screenwriting, we're always taught the phrase, show, don't tell. What this really means is to respect the audience and let them be involved in formulating the story experience. Ethan and Joel Cohen are masters at this. Look at how we gain insight into Marge and Norm's relationship. Hi, it's Marge. Thanks, hon. Time to shove off. Love you, Margie. Love you, hon. You got Arby's all over me. Well, I'm turning in, Norm. And look at how they cleverly develop Marge's tryst with Mike Yanagita. Mike Yanagita, remember me? Yeah, I'm down in the Twin Cities. I think I'll take a drive down there then. Oh, yeah? Twin Cities? Would you happen to know a good place for lunch in the downtown area? And when it comes to Norm's contest for the Postal Service, do they ever outright explain what's going on? No. Hey, you, Norm. How's the painting going? Not too bad, you know. Found out the Hauptmans are entering a painting this year. Oh, hon, you're better than them. They announced it. So? Three-cent stamp. You're Mallard? They also let the audience put two and two together when it comes to acts of violence. Fuck her for her. Uh, she started shrieking, you know. The audience is also allowed to discern a character's intentions. For example, when Jerry discovers Wade's dead body. Once Carl has the money, we figure out his new scheme. I got the money. That's 40 for you, 40 for me. Here, we know exactly what Jerry is up to because of this. I just need on these last, uh, these financing documents that you sent us, I, I can't read the serial numbers here. So... Why don't I just fax you over a copy? No, no, well, no fax is no good. That's what I have, and I, I can't read the darn yeah. thing. Respect the audience and let them participate, and they will thank you for giving them a great experience. When it comes to making a rich story world that is both believable and realistic, the devil is in the details. 
The Coen brothers use very specific, not generic, terminology to make their story come to life. The most obvious case is when it comes to places in Minnesota. 40 acres there in Wayzata. So where are you girls from? Chaska, Lesueur, but I went to high school in White Bear Lake. You know, go Bears. That right there would be a violation of your parole. What ends you back in Stillwater? You're living in a diner then? Oh, it's actually Eden Prairie, that, that school district. If Stan calls, you just tell him I went to Embers. White Bear Lake? Yeah, well, at Eklund and Swedland, that's closer to Moose Lake. Another way to be specific with details is when it comes to the characters. For example, the people in Minnesota sure do love their hockey. What you watching there? Gophers. Notice how he doesn't say something weak and generic like the hockey game. You going to the Gophers on Sunday? Oh, well, you betcha. You wouldn't have an extra ticket. You kidding? We don't want you going out for hockey. Oh, man. Mike Yanagita is an old classmate of Marge's. So how is it expertly and quickly established that they go way back? He doesn't use her married name. Is this Marge? Yeah. Margie Olmsted? He uses this dorky nickname. You went and married Norm, son of a Gunderson. And they talk about another classmate. I was married to Linda Cooksey. You, you remember Linda. She was a year behind us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here are some other quick examples. When Wade talks about money. If I want a bank interest on 750000 I'd go to Midwest Federal, talk to old Bill Deal. He's at North Star. When Jerry tries to hide things from Scotty. If Lorraine calls, or Sylvia, you just say mom's down in Florida with Pearl and Marty. And finally, the characters speak in realistic terms when it comes to objects. Norm doesn't say bait or worms. What are those, night crawlers? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Tom. Notice how the people talk about automobiles. It's out in the lot there, brand new burnt umber Sierra. Hun? Yeah? Prowler needs a jump. Mr. Anderson, is this your Burgundy 98 out here? So remember, be specific, not generic, and your story will come to life. They say you reveal true character in the actions you take. In this movie, we have Jerry Lundergaard and Carl Showalter. Neither gets the respect they want from others. You ever been to Minneapolis? Nope. Find that work interesting, do you? What are you talking about? Well, I'm sorry, sir. We still got to charge you the four dollars. This could work out real good for me and Gene and Scotty. Gene and Scotty never have to worry. You're a bald-faced liar. Fucking please. With all due respect, Jerry, I don't want you mucking this up. What the heck do you mean? However, Carl seems to be the shadow version of Jerry. He does what Jerry is unable to do. For example, Gear doesn't talk much to Carl, so here's his reaction. Would it kill you to say something? Shep Proudfoot says very little to Jerry, but here's how he reacts. An alternate number, and I would have you. Nope. Okay, well, I'll look at them. When Carl gets interrupted, he responds in anger. We need more this was money. supposed to be a no rough stuff type deal. Don't ever interrupt me, Jerry. Just shut the fuck up. And what does Jerry do? No, see. There's a million dollars here. No, see. Look, Jerry, you're not selling me a damn car. When things don't go Carl's way, these are his reactions. Well, I'm sorry, sir. We still got to charge you the $4. I guess you think you're, uh, you know, like an authority figure? That stupid fucking uniform, huh, buddy? No, Gene. No money. Is this a fucking joke here? Meanwhile, Jerry remains powerless. Damn it! However, both ways lead to the respective downfall. Okay. I'll do a damn lot count. You're darn tootin'. <sighs> oh, for Pete's sake. He's fleeing the interview. He's fleeing the interview. I'm taking a Sierra. We split that. I'm taking that fucking car. That fuck is mine. Oh! Ah! So what are your thoughts? Anything you'd like to add? Join the conversation by leaving a comment below. If you like Script Sleuth and the work we're doing, please support us on Patreon to get special patron-only benefits. And if you haven't done so already, 
be sure to subscribe for upcoming videos. Thank you so much for watching.